Welcome everyone to this side event of the 53rd UN Statistical Commission on uh, mobilizing innovation through partnership and collaboration. Uh, the event today is uh, jointly organized by the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, the Sustainable Development Solution Network Trends, uh, the Development Data Group of the World Bank and our Statistics Division. Uh, uh, the, um, the, these are the, the, the four core partners of the Data for Now initiatives, initiative. Uh, I'm Francesca Perucci from the UN Statistics Division. Uh, Data for Now uh, was launched uh, already almost two and a half years ago in September 2019 uh, to address the concern that serious gaps still remained after several years in the, into the implementation of the 2030 agenda, both in terms of coverage and timeliness. Uh, millions of people uh, remained uh, missing uh, around the world from the data we collect and we use, and therefore there the, the, are still ex excluded from, uh, from decision making and, and from uh, informing the policies uh, that will eventually affect them. Uh, as we will hear shortly, the initiative is about really bringing uh, and developing national capacity uh, to use and mainstream uh, the, the, the use of innovative data uh, sources, uh, methods, technologies uh, for, for the production of timely and disaggregated data for the SDGs. Uh, and is based on, on partnerships across the data system and also uh, with uh, other experts outside the data system from uh, the, the bring technical solutions, uh, including academia, business sector, civil society, uh, and also engaging uh, with other parts of, of the government. But what makes uh, this initiative, I would say, quite unique is that it takes a user-centric approach with each country working on what they establish as their priorities in terms of the data that they most urgently need to, uh, that they are most urgently needed to meet the user's demand. So every country works and focuses on something different, but then eventually those solutions are shared and benefit a larger number of, of partners and countries. So the event today is an opportunity to review the work that's already been done uh, and we'll hear uh, from very interesting experiences in countries. Uh, we'll also highlight some of the partnerships that made that possible and that have been formed during, uh, during this work. Uh, but before uh, I pass it over to Grant Cameron, who's one of the key partners in uh, the director of uh, uh, SDSN Trends, uh, I'd just like to remind you the event is recorded uh, and uh, you also have um, an opportunity then to ask questions later. There will be uh, Q&A sessions. Uh, but let me now uh, turn, uh, turn it over to Grant. Grant, over to you. Thanks very much, Francesca, for that introduction. And uh, welcome to everyone uh, to this side event. Uh, I'm delighted to make some opening remarks, uh, but I recognize I'm standing in the way of a number of great presentation and panelists so I'm going to restrict my remarks to really just three thoughts. First, I think, as uh, Francesca said, um, I just want to remind us all that the overall objective of the Data for Now initiative, and then I just want to um, have two additional thoughts on why we at SDSN Trends, and I'm sure it's not just we at Trends, but all of us who are really engaged in this initiative are so excited to be a part of it. So you'll really hear three things from me. So first, the objective. I think uh, Francesca encapsulated the objective very, very well. Um, it's really focused on building capacity to deploy the best knowledge and tools for better data uh, for, for um, all of us to achieve the SDGs. So I mean, I think it's a very clear and it's a, it's a really critical um, objective of this initiative. And then why are we excited to be a part of this? And there's really two words that come to my mind when uh, I think about how the Data for Now initiative works to meet its objective. Um, and they both start with the letter I. Um, the first is innovation. So I think in the international statistics community, we tend to think of innovations in terms of adopting new technologies and tools to produce and use more relevant data for decision-making. And, th and this session will showcase recent initiatives in Colombia and Senegal that demonstrate this aspect of innovation. But Data for Now also supports innovations in collaborations. And I think um, Francesca touched upon that in her opening remarks as well. 
how groups come together to create and use data in new ways for the SDGs. Sometimes these innovations and collaborative structures aren't as visible as new platforms or tools, but they are just as essential if we are to fill key data gaps necessary for improving development outcomes. In supporting better country level data systems, data for now recognizes that fostering trust in new collaborations takes time, as often the participants have not worked together in the past. But we find that once these trusts have been developed, these collaborations bear fruit. They contribute to local ownership of the task at hand, and they contribute to the long run sustainability of the enterprise. Perhaps it's because country collaborations are designed to crowd in local implementation support to improve the prospect of the sustainable new processes is why it's so successful. In the same spirit of collaboration, we can find in the way in which the Data for Now four core international organizing partners work together. And again, let's remind ourselves it's the World Bank, the UN Stats Division, Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, and ourselves at SDSN Trends. Over the past year, we've agreed to a set of guiding principles that we adhere to when we work together. And with country leadership as the main principle, and with the National Statistical Offices at the center, we have committed to being outcome oriented, working together in support of, part of participating countries. And it's our conviction to these principles that bind us and provide the momentum behind the data for now. Along with innovation, a second word that describes the data for now initiative is inclusivity. That's my second word that starts with the lever I. Claire Melamed, who you'll hear from in a few minutes as, uh, as sort of moderating our panel, describes the data for now initiative as a community. As collaboratives are at the heart of everything we do, we leverage innovations developed in intergovernmental organizations, bilateral agencies, academia, civil society, and the private sector to improve data for development. And all of these contributions have adopted the same principles. In addition, the list of partner countries is expanding. And I myself am looking forward to hearing more from the panelists about their perspectives on data for now. So as you listen to the speakers and the panelists that follow, and now that you sort of understand the enthusiasm that we have because this is a very innovative and inclusive project, I hope you get the sense of um, how this joint enterprise will work. And we would encourage you to think about joining this initiative as well. So thanks very much and back to you, Francesca. Thank you so much, Grant. And uh, it's now my Great pleasure to introduce the first speakers uh, who will uh, talk about work done under the um, uh, SDG uh, Goal 16. Uh, they are from Colombia and Armenia. Uh, Ms. Juliette Solano, who's the technical director of the regulation division in uh, DANE, the statistical office of Colombia, and Mr. Bahan Martirosian. Uh, from UNDP's SDG Innovation Lab in Armenia. And uh, there we talk about using social media data to complement information on SDG uh, 16 in Colombia. Uh, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thanks a lot uh, for the invitation to this event. We are going to, uh, together with the hand, we are going to change, uh, share our experience in the calculation of the SDG 16 using social networks. I would like to ask if I can have permissions to share the screen of um, you are going to present. It should be live now. Okay, I hope you are seeing right now uh, our, our presentation. I want to start uh, talking about experimental statistics that has been uh, a project Danny has been designed and implementing in a way to incorporate innovations uh, in the sources we are being used to produce statistical uh, data, but also in the statistical methodologies, but 
also in the provision of a statistical information for themes that are not previously measured with traditional sources. This uh, approach of experimental statistics and the innovation it pretends requires a quality assurance scheme. For that, we have taken into account the United uh, Nations Statistical Quality Framework, the second version of the handbook for uh, uh, the quality management at statistical pro uh, production that incorporates also the importance of the quality management in terms of the SDG indicators. We also uh, have taken into account the standards of the statistical production and specific standards to uh, work with these new sources as the CRISDM, but we also consider uh, the GANSO, the GSBPM, and other kind of standards that support uh, this initiative. And uh, based on uh, the experience and the frameworks and the standards, we are uh, building a guidelines and directives uh, in order to provide a orientation for the national statistical system at, uh, in the incorporation of these new uh, alternative sources. In terms of the approach, uh, we were using the CRISDM model. The model has a uh, five phases in which we start with the business understanding, then we move to the data understanding, data preparation, execute the modeling component, execute evaluation, and based on that, we uh, define if we can start a deployment phase. In all this moment, um, we need to ensure a quality management uh, in each one of the phases and the result we were obtaining. Continue, Bahan. Uh, yes, so uh, in the interest of time, I will uh, keep things very brief so that we can maybe get more into depth on our JATE. So uh, we take a very holistic approach to data quality assessment, and we take the approach from the scope of the entire pipeline. Uh, so we begin it by assessing the quality of data uh, of our data collection procedure, uh, focusing on stability of data gathering, and also the quality of the data of the data gathered um, relative to the target population that we're uh, attempting to study. Uh, so uh, in the quality of data collection, uh, we're interested in the parallel scraping of large numbers of uh, profiles from social media uh, platforms such as Facebook. And uh, we have several technical uh, disciplines to assess the stability of the data gathering procedure. And we also rely on uh, several demographic analysis modules to analyze the uh, demographic breakdown of the uh, user data that we collect and assess its uh, similarity with the population uh, distribution of Colombia in general. Uh, having gathered the data, we are now concerned with the quality of the data modeling. Uh, and uh, we uh, use unsupervised analysis, supervised modeling, and also uh, contextual information analysis in order to ensure uh, high quality models. And in order to ensure uh, a relative minimal uh, resources as far as physical and uh, the human labor is concerned, we rely on zero shot classification uh, and, and different types of computer vision and natural language processing algorithms, uh, which we will delve more into uh, as we go forward in the presentation. Thank you. Okay, uh, in continuing with the CRISDN uh, uh, model in the business understanding phase, our tar target was to obtain complementary measurements of the SDG system associated with the perception of discrimination through Facebook. Uh, let's remember that the SDGs we were working on are the 10 3, 1 and 60B1, proportion of the population reporting having felt personally discriminated against yeah. or harassed in the last 12 months, and SDG 1672, proportion of the population that believes that decision-making is inclusive and responsive by gender, age, disability, and population group. The specific objectives were to have information to establish baseline to measure perception of discrimination because we don't are not provided a, a complete and disaggregate information for this uh, phenomena but also to produce complementary or contrasting information for the political culture survey that is our traditional measure for the topic of discrimination uh, and taking into account the, uh, the international humanitarian law. Our hypothesis is that 
discussion on social networks such as Facebook or Twitter, uh, or Twitter or so on can reflect social discourse in online work. Therefore, by tracking and measuring relevant variables of online activity, it is feasible to obtain granular proxy indicators for actual social trends and their underlying factors. Uh, we face some challenges uh, from the beginning uh, in this understanding of the problem and the objective we have. Uh, there are four challenges I want to mention. The first one uh, was uh, the few experiences we have at the national statistics offices in the use of social networks to measure uh, discrimination. Uh, the second one, uh, one was the lack of technical capability or uh, we have previous experiences with uh, simple models for test mining, but this approach required expert knowledge. Yeah, in these possible bets that one we maintained. At Sorry, uh, in this in this um, process, the support of the data for now initiative was very critical. Uh, uh, the next challenge was associated with the data collection. We also have previous experience with Twitter, but not with Facebook. So we need to deal with problems of downloading these profiles and images for the demographic analysis. In terms of the quality assurance, we also uh, have initiated some quality audits for the SDGs, but in this case, we need to ensure the adequate uh, performance of the model that we explore and answer or resolve the problem of representativeness to ensure that uh, the results we are going to have are sound and can be uh, associated with the uh, actual situation uh, of Colombia. Uh, in the data preparation phase, we execute the characterization of the information uh, downloaded from Facebook. This allows us to see how in the, in the recent years has been an increase, an accelerated increase in the number of Facebook comments. So this shows us that this source is relevant for the topic we want to explore. Uh, as Baham was mentioning, uh, we explore in the modeling component uh, natural, uh, natural language processing uh, in three steps. The first step was the unsupervised analysis in which we use four models, the zero shot classification, LDA, sentiment analysis, and hate speech recognition. And based on the learnings of on the supervised analysis, we execute the supervised analysis uh, in, in discrimination. And in, this, in the third step, uh, we execute the contextual information based on our prediction model using Google News. Continue by hand. Uh, yes, thank you, Julius. Uh, so uh, this uh, slide shows some of the performance of, of uh, language classification as carried out by the zero shot classification models for Spanish language, uh, fine tuned for the Spanish language. Uh, so as we can see, we have several uh, in the columns, we have several uh, types of discrimination, including uh, racial discrimination, economic, political, immigration, so on and so forth. And we have under the text column, the, uh, the comment that is uh, being analyzed. And under the columns for each of the types of discrimination are the degrees of likelihood, or uh, a, a sort of like a proxy indicator for uh, probability that uh, the, the comment pertains to one of these uh, types of discrimination. So the example here um, for those who speak in Spanish, uh, it, it uh, pertains perfectly to the topic of uh, political discrimination. And this is reflected by the fact that the model has assessed the 0.999 or almost 100% likelihood that uh, the, this is in fact the political discrimination comment. And this is done for hundreds and thousands of comments. I think um, uh, right now we have over 700,000 comments that are being analyzed uh, in this using this methodology. Thank you. Um, and uh, here. And uh, this shows the of the, um, the time series which depicts on uh, May 29th, for example, there was a uh, the, there was the maximum for uh, uh, for the number of, of political discrimination comments, 
And this is actually related with the peak of the deaths and infection rates for COVID-19, which caused a certain degree of, uh, um, of disenchantment on the part of the uh, civilians and uh, citizens of Colombia. And then we have a uh, downturn on June 20, uh, on June 2nd which was related with a uh, mobility restrictions in Bogota and Medellin, which are some of the, uh, the two of the largest cities in Colombia. So we can see uh, kind of how the Facebook acts as a proxy indicator for uh, what is going for the general kind of consensus in society. Thank you. Um, and yeah, this is just another look at the same slide. Thank you, Baham. Continuing with the modeling components, uh, we need to resolve the demographic analysis to ensure the representativeness of this data with the structure uh, uh, on gender of the general population. For this, we train a model to estimate gender based on a person's name, and we train this model using the population-based register. The model has a, a good performance of 88.5% of precision, and this allows us to have the two structures of the distribution of the population uh, by gender from uh, the Colombia based on the population register and compare it with the gender distribution in Colombia for the Facebook users. So uh, with this comparison analysis, we can uh, ensure that we have an, a sample structure that is a, that agrees or respects the Colombia uh, gender uh, distribution. Um, so speaking a little bit about uh, gender and age classification based on profile pictures, we've implemented a uh, pipeline for uh, image classification, which is also based on the open AI clip model. Um, and uh, it has um, gender classification, which is uh, very, which has a high, very high accuracy rate and age classification, which is also relatively high uh, compared to the state of the art uh, in the field right now. And uh, using some data cleaning uh, procedures and this language classification were able to extract uh, gender and age uh, from images and we're forced to do this in fact because you know most users do not uh, include age or gender explicitly as part of their profile descriptions thank you with this, we close the unsupervised analysis and we move with the supervised analysis taking into account the previous knowledge we gained in this part of the process, we uh, select a sampling, a random sampling of 150 comments. And on this sample, we execute a first iteration of classification with nine laborers uh, that uh, make the job. And then we execute a second iteration uh, in, on a sample that was expanded with 600 uh, comments and uh, for discrimination and a thousand uh, comments for uh, representativeness. Uh, Juliette, I'm sorry to interrupt you. If you could wrap up in, in less than a minute. Okay, perfect. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you okay, so much. Sorry. Okay, just uh, this is a technical part. We calculate the kappa um, and cohen coefficient and uh, then uh, continue behind with the final considerations of this part. Uh, yes. So, um... Uh, we're still, uh, we're still, uh, you know, actively researching some of the ways of overcoming uh, data quality issues. For example, uh, with uh, lack of representative, with uh, trying to understand how representative the data is with regards to the general population of Colombia, and this is the most difficult part. Uh, so the most difficult part is in fact trying to uh, understand the, the demographic distributions and their uh, relative similarities. Um, and uh, uh, so, so um, the remaining uh, the remaining portion of the task is actually related with you know increasing the accuracy of the language classification models, increasing the stability of the data gathering pipeline, and also increasing the uh, representativeness of the data by capturing a larger proportion of the uh, at least uh, population that is active in the social media landscape. Thank you. Thank you. Just a final remarks, because I think it's important to share this for our experience. <clears throat> we need to, like, I want to highlight the importance of having a cloud services that support all the technological architecture of these projects. 
I also want to highlight the importance of have cooperation for data for now in order to ensure we have capacities and trainings, uh, specific trainings to resolve the uh, problems we face uh, or along the project. I, I also want to highlight the importance of working with other actors of the national statistical system as the Presidential Council for Human Rights that allow us to uh, ensure a sound methodology for the classification of the comments. So I think this uh, has been an amazing opportunity to learn and to have uh, improved our capacities to uh, explore and use these alternative sources. So thank you. Thank you so much, Juliet and Bahan. It's incredibly interesting. I wish we had more time. Sorry to have having to rush you, but uh, uh, it's great uh, what you shared already. Very interesting. Um, so uh, I'd like now to turn to uh, our um, speakers from uh, Senegal. Uh, before I do so, though, let me remind you, you can put questions uh, both on the chat, or, but preferably in the Q&A part of the, of the platform, uh, the Zoom platform, so that we can uh, then later address your questions. Uh, so now over to Senegal. Uh, they will be talking about engaging with national statistical system to build a COVID-19 hub in the country. Uh, so we have with us today uh, Madonna Wissi Sal, who's from uh, ANSD, the statistical office uh, of uh, Senegal. Uh, she's this, the national statistical office focal point for the Data for Now project, a statistician and, uh, in, in the national statistical office and works in uh, programming, harmonization, statistical coordination and international cooperation. And we also have Sheikh Faye uh, from the Initiative Prospective Agricole and Rural IPAR uh, from Senegal also. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I am happy to present the Data for Now project in Senegal. Uh, the National Statistical Office of Senegal, uh, ANSD, is the owner of the project at the country level. To explain briefly, in Senegal, there is a law uh, that defines the institutional component of the national statistical system. According to this law, the National Agency for Statistics and Demography is uh, the main statistical body of the NSS. The other public structures of the NSS are also identified by this law. In its implementation, the Data for Now project has adopted a participatory approach. First, to identify priorities, a workshop was organized in Kigali. During this workshop, five teams on which to focus were identified based on an alignment between the SDGs and the National Strategic Plan. After several consultations, ANSD and SSS stakeholders have chosen to focus on indicators not yet produced by the NSS and for which information is available. During the implementation of the project, the case stakeholders are involved. Indeed, the ANSD ensures the availability to scheduled training workshops. All, yeah, can you skip to the other slide? Yeah, I am, I am on this slide. Yeah, thank you. Uh, during the implementation of the project, the case stakeholders are involved. Indeed, the NSD ensures the availability to scheduled training workshops. All NSS stakeholders who are potentially involved in the production of data for the calculation of priority indicators are invited and the opinion are considering after the training session. Next. The project has also facilitated the involvement of and the direct collaboration with several partners along the entire process. Three of the key partners involved in the capacity building on SSS stakeholders in Senegal are FAO, UN Habitat, and United Nations Statistics Division. You know, I am, uh, no, I'm sorry, but yeah, I am in, on this slide. No, not this one. Yeah, this one. Thank you. Uh, so I was saying that the three of uh, our key partners involved in the capacity building of NSS stakeholders in Senegal are FAO, UN Habitat, 
and United Nations Statistics Division. So in collaboration with FAO, D4N helps to build the capacity of ANSD and SSS stakeholders to produce this indicator themselves. To do so, an FIS training was organized on September 8 and 9. A training on the indicator 231 and 232 was conducted on November 23rd and 24, and another training for the same indicator is scheduled for May 24 to 27. In collaboration with UN Habitat, a training workshop is scheduled in the first week of May. And in collaboration with the United Nations Statistics Division, D4N project plan capacity building on the small area estimation. Next. So this is, not, this is the good one. Add IT and architecture. Uh, to, support, to support data for now innovation projects in the prioritized thematic areas, an IT consultant was hired to work in close collaboration with ANSD technical team to implement the technological infrastructure environment needed. The first step was to make an analysis of the current situation. This analysis showed that ANSD uses various and diverse data sources from different surveys and from different databases sent by NSS stakeholders. These data sources are in different formats, SPSS, Stata, Excel, and even Word. The work of processing this data requires several steps that often involve the intervention of the IT team, which will carry out manual work for each query. Ultimately, no, we, yeah, thank you. Ultimately, this leaves less time for statistical analysis work. After a workshop and discussion with the NSD teams, a customized platform was identified to have an unified method of storing and processing massive data from various sources. The main objective is to improve the production of the SDGs and create a single shared source of truth. We have reached the deployment stage of this platform. Close work between UNSD and the NSD IT team was allowed, has allowed to define the workflow. Two consultants have been hired. The data that will be used to set up this platform has been identified. It will be the COVID-19 data produced by the NSS. Meetings between the consultants and the INSD team were held to discuss on the work scheduled and the technical prerequisites to be set up. Next. Uh, I will not insist on this part. Next. Thank you. Uh, no, you can return back. Thank you. Um, so I will go directly uh, uh, to the last priority theme, which is the COVID-19. So to set up a hub data platform on COVID-19 in Senegal, the D4N project hired a consultant to conduct the data cataloging and profiling of the various COVID-19 database produced by the NSS stakeholders. The consultant's findings identified the 10 most relevant database produced by the NSS stakeholders. NSD is in the process of retrieving them to set up an integrated platform of COVID-19. So we let uh, la parole à Cher. Cher, c'est à ton tour. Um, thank you, Madame. Uh, indeed, the study has uh, identified 30 databases and the, the 10 uh, most relevant. And just remember that the purpose of this study uh, was therefore uh, identify COVID-19 related databases and determine their, their suitability for integration into a national uh, data platform. Also review sources for data deemed relevant and uh, profile identified data sources. And in order to achieve 
uh, these objectives use uh, methodology taking in account the context of, uh, of, of pandemic. The context, uh, the, the COVID-19 context uh, require a virtual communication approach due to the limitation of physical uh, contact. Thus, we conducted data collection mainly by telephone and the approach uh, consisted of uh, identify NSS structure that produce pandemic related data, uh, mapping data set and selecting the top 10 priority uh, data set based on an uh, indicator of relevance. To do this, we use uh, the list of uh, 95 member structure provided by NSD. Uh, these allow us to identify 30 data sets and profile them with the indicators of uh, relevance. And for the uh, the the six the profile we can that say that the magnitude of COVID nineteen has led to sign to significant uh, data collection and monitoring initiatives. Thus, uh, the need to produce um, data are generally indispensable for a set of actors. Thus, more than half of the data are produced regularly or 56.7%. Uh, However, the accessibility of this data is problematic. Only 50% uh, are accessible to any user. They are mainly from administrative sources and uh, sample survey. In terms of representativeness and disaggregation, 70% uh, of data set can be disaggregated by region and 90% of identified data can be disaggregated by, by sex. All data profiling information was used to construct the relevant index. Uh, the relevant index uh, and uh, data relevance index for the COVID-19 data platform feed rank it the 30 data sets in order of relevance. In this table that you see on the screen, uh, you, you see the, the 10 most relevant data uh, bases. These are data to flow up on the pandemic. There are data to access the impact of the pandemic on uh, com com commodity, commodity prices and uh, data also could, to, to sorry, measure. Could you please uh, go to the full presentation mode? It's difficult to see the table. Uh, you can't see the, the table. Um, it's, it's in the edit mode. If you could switch it to the presentation mode. Um, let me, one second. Um, Try pressing F5. That's okay. Yes, much better. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the data that you are uh, see in the screen are related to uh, data we can use to, to measure the impact of the pandemic on the uh, maritime traffic on employment. Uh, we can use also data uh, to, to, to measure impact on the culture, on uh, uh, so sanitation, but we can use also data for uh to 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 know uh, what is the impact of the the pandemic in in our um 
in in uh, in in threat uh, but uh, in in conclusion we can say that uh, SID provides benchmarking uh, benchmarking to <clears throat> for measuring and tracking the 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 spread of the covid-19 pandemic but also the 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 impact in in senegal to help inform decision thank you thank you so much it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Claire Melamed, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, who will moderate uh, the panel uh, with great panelists. Uh, Claire, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Francesca. Thank you all. What really interesting um, and stimulating presentations. I really, really enjoyed that and great to hear how this Data for Now program is having an impact at the country level in that some of those very specific ways that we're seeing filling data gaps that hopefully will help us all to make faster progress on some of the critical sustainable development goals. Um, it's a great pleasure now to introduce to you a panel and our aim here in this session is really to think to sort of zoom out from these really interesting and inspiring country examples and think about some of the um, just to, to think more broadly about the Data for Now initiative and how that can support progress, um, su support progress in other countries, across different regions. And I very much hope that all of you who are watching uh, online and very warm welcome to you all, um, will be able to understand from this conversation and think about the ways in which perhaps you might be able to get involved in the Data for Now community. As Grant said at the beginning, we think of this as a community. We want this to be a network through which we can disseminate innovation, learn from each other, develop um, new ways of doing things, and in doing so, help to make progress on key policy priorities. So really happy to introduce my panelists um, who I can't see. So I don't know, colleagues, uh, if you'd like to, to turn your cameras on. Charles, a well, very warm welcome to you. Lovely to, um, to see you all here. Um, I'm going to very quickly um, introduce everybody just by, by name and title. So perhaps you can just give us a little wave um, when I say your name, and then we'll jump straight into the, um, into the conversation. So very happy to welcome on our panel, Mr. Birato Yigezu, who is the uh, Director General of the Ethiopia Statistics Service. Welcome to you. To welcome Mr. Omar Seydou, who is the Coordinator for Data for SDGs in the Ghana Statistical Service. Lovely to see you there, Omar. Um, to welcome Ms. Uh, Yanni Utiklen, who is the Head of Division for the International Development Cooperation in Statistics Norway. Um, also, um, an old friend of Data for Now, with Dr. Charles Kimpolo from the African Institute for Mathematical Scientists, and very happy to also greet uh, Miss Rachel Beaven, who is uh, the Director for Statistics at the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, known by to some of you as UN SCAP. So, very very warm welcome to you all. It's really lovely, um, really lovely to be with you today. So let me start um, perhaps uh, perhaps with a, a question for you, uh, for you, Buratu. I know that Ethiopia is a country which has um, recently joined Data for Now and it is developing um, the, the, the program and the activities. What, what do you see as the main benefit of the Data for Now program for statistics in Ethiopia? What motivated you to want to be part of this community? You could just uh, turn your microphone on. That would be great. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Claire. Uh, data for now is a very good and a relevant initiative for development, uh, uh, developing countries like Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopian Statistics Service previously called the Ethiopian Statistics Agency. Now the name is Ethiopian Statistics Service appreciate the aim of the initiatives 
uh, which is to increase the use of ro robust methods and uh, tools that improve the timeliness, coverage, and the quality of the SDG data. We also inspired by today's presentation, and uh, we are happy to be part of uh, this initiative. Uh, when we develop our national strategy for development of statistics, we have identified the uh, improving the existing methodology is uh, very important to be able to produce required data for evaluating the SDG and the, the country's national development plan goals. This includes implementing also small area estimation technique to get more disaggregated data and also to improve the quality of administrative data to be more usable. We are also interested to use innovative sources and methods to fill the data gap. Uh, the, our office also has a good experience in using um, geospatial information and we will continue to use this resource to get more disaggregated data and also to improve the quality of existing data. We are also planning to work with the civil society organization to uh, design standard procedures to improve the quality of citizen generated data. Ethiopian Statistics Office believes that this partnership will help us to develop and build our capacity to test and implement the appropriate methodology and to use innovative sources and methods to fill the data gap. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barati. That was really helpful. And I think, you know, points, I think, for others who are considering their involvement in, in data for now to to note there is particularly, Birati, what you mentioned there about innovations in some of the foundational data sources, administrative data and so on, as well as geospatial and other more sort of technologically focused data. That innovation is not just for fancy things and you know social media and so on. Innovation is also for the bedrock, the heart of national statistical systems. I think that was fantastic to, to hear that point made so early in the discussion. And also, of course, the engagement of civil society and other stakeholders and how important it is to all of us as we're building these systems to make sure that we have the engagement of others, both as consumers and, and users of data. So thank you, um, really, really helpful. Um, I think our colleague from um, from Ghana has temporarily um, is, is temporarily um, lost his connection. So hoping that we uh, are able to reconnect with with Omar um, very shortly. But let me um, perhaps um, ask you, Jana. Um, also, uh, as Statistics Norway um, has been long been a supporter of of Data for Now, but uh, but I know that some of your involvement has been more recent. So. Similarly, I'd love to hear from you, um, you know, what motivated Statistics Norway to want to be part of this Data for Now community? And what are you hoping that you will gain from your, uh, from your uh, interaction, as well as, of course, being able to, to contribute um, to the rest of the community? So, so thank you, Claire. As you're saying, we're, of course, now start in, still in the, in the starting phase. So maybe just say a little bit about that first. We are... Uh, uh, just starting now uh, last year, our dialogue with UNSD, and we had the first meeting with uh, Colombia in the fall. So, so far, we're mainly learning about what uh, others are doing and getting inspired from the Colombian example. Uh, but now uh, we're looking, of course, to find uh, potential partners and projects where we can contribute also and work together with collaborations. But for us now, the first and maybe most important step is to look at actual demand and find out what potential partners in the Data for Now initiative uh, requests. So one important advantage we find from this initiative is that it focuses on being demand driven and that the prioritization should involve not only the NSOs, but also the um, relevant stakeholders, as mentioned before. Secondly, we also have to ensure that we, are, uh, we have the right experts available and uh, and this can sometimes be challenging, so we have to plan a little bit ahead. So uh, are, we are already at this stage thinking a little bit about how or where we can uh, where we can be involved. So just to mention that quickly as well, 
uh, we are looking at two main parts where the first one is related to the use of administrative data. As just mentioned by you also, there is innovative methods of using administrative data, and this is important to keep in mind. So this is an area where we have a long experience in statistics in Norway, and we do get a lot of requests for support. And we see that many NSOs are very keen to take better advantage of the administrative data in the countries. Uh, so typical questions would be often about the quality of administ administrative data, um, also how to, uh, to link the data or how to get access to data. Uh, so these are areas where we could typically, typically be involved in future. Uh, the other part would focus on methodologies and uh, innovating use of uh, data sources. So here we're exploring different possibilities, which could include web scraping, geospatial data, machine learnings as some examples. Uh, so I think uh, uh, from, uh, from our side, uh, I can also just mention that because we do have, of course, being at the very early stage of this, we are also looking at how we can contribute. But what I can say is also we have, uh, we have a big team we can draw on. So we have uh, just counting the last three years, we have more than 100 different experts that have been involved in our experts or in our projects from the different departments. So we can draw on a very broad range of expertise and topics. So this also makes this project very interesting because we see here we're looking more at the, going more towards uh, innovation and working in a different way than maybe in the more traditional projects. So we see that many are keen to contribute. But as mentioned, we are still at the early stage. So we're very keen to see how we can now uh, forward, work together with uh, more partners. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jenna. Thank you. And I'm so glad you mentioned at the beginning the critical importance of being demand driven and the way that this, the Data for Now program, is very much built on the priorities of those participating countries, the ones that you've heard from. And again, for those of you who, who are listening, you know, that is what we really want to know for those, um, particularly government partners who are, or statistics partners who are wondering about perhaps how to get involved. You know, this is very much built from the priorities of our partners. And Jana, as you said, then to sort of try to match up where we can put together the right technical support and also build the right communities where different, where there are kind of common challenges. How can we enable partners, government partners and other stakeholders to learn from each other and share some of their experiences? And that is very much the sort of bedrock of how the Data for Now program operates. So Omar, let me now um, turn to you as someone who um, has had, has been involved with Data for Now from the very beginning um, and has seen um, in Ghana that, you know, is really spearheaded um, the Data for Now program in Ghana and, you know, helped to, to help us, I think, all to understand how that the kind of um, partnerships that we're able to offer can be helpful in, in helping you and your colleagues at the Ghana Statistical Service to, um, to really carry out your priorities and make sure um, of the contribution you're making to, to the policy making progress uh, process within Ghana. So I'd love to hear a little bit about you know, how, what motivated you at the, the very beginning stages to be interested in this program, and then perhaps a little bit more on how it's particularly enabled you to, to engage with policymakers and to really lead to the end of the process around actually using data to inform decision making um, in, in the country. Over to you, Omar. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so as uh, you, you rightly um, indicated, Ghana has been part of this from the onset, and it's more around the identification that uh, policymakers, and especially um, a comment uh, from our vice president, who says that um, politicians make decisions at 3 a.m. And at that time, in 3 a.m., when everybody is sleeping, they need data then to make those decisions. And the absence of the data, they will go ahead with the decisions anyway. And so we uh, saw data for now to be a great opportunity uh, to, to, to engage in and uh, make sure we're able to meet this uh, particular demand. So what we have done is to try to leverage the, this opportunity uh, to innovate around uh, using non-traditional data sources that can turn, uh, turn in more quick data uh, information to support policies. Um, quick examples. Uh, for instance, when we got COVID, come uh, 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 the, the first cases of COVID in Ghana, and the 
the president of Ghana uh, instituted the, the lockdown. Within three days, we came up with mobility analysis uh, to support government to understand how people were responding to the lockdown in the major cities that a lockdown had been established. And this could not have been possible if we had not used innovative data systems. Because within three days of the lockdown, these were already published. Another thing we have been able to, to, to do is to leverage this. And um, if you under, understand the context of Ghana, illegal mining is one of the things that is driving uh, the, the loss of forest uh, cover. And, and so using uh, this platform, we were able to identify over the last couple of years, some of the forest reserves, protected areas that have been deforested. And we had documented this for a period of five years. And when we made the presentation to the parliament of Ghana, we got the speaker of the parliament of Ghana, especially in the year 2020, when uh, the destruction in one particular forest reserve was 10% which was more than the discussion over the last five years. So the, 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 the leader of the uh, government business in parliament said, Omar, we need you to present this to cabinet because we need to understand the destruction we are causing to ourselves. So this gives us indication that when you have data at the time policymakers need it, they are able to uh, act promptly to resolve issues. Another example I would want to use is for the first time in the history of Ghana's statistical service, we had opportunity of being part of a, a, a parliamentary uh, committee going to, uh, over, um, to perform their oversight uh, responsibilities in selected areas. And so quickly we mobilized data together within a week for those areas uh, on SDGs goals one, three, and four, and, and data covering a, a period using administrative data covering a period of six years. And when they visited those areas for the oversight, they could see that there was no proper alignment of the evidence available through what we compile and the program being implemented by those. Areas. So that immediately triggered some action by the members of parliament. And so these have been some of um, uh, the benefits that we have immediately seen um, uh, being part of this uh, program. And, and this, we, we believe, is something that we want to continue to be part of. Thank you so much, Omar. Um, and thanks for all your work and support during the, the duration of, of Data for Now. And I think that point about parliaments is so critical. You know, as you say, your vice president is really a trailblazer in the use of data in the executive for decision making for policy making and so on. But obviously your work engaging with parliament is so critical in the use of data for accountability. Um, and, you know, just as, as we think about data for policy making, we also mustn't forget the critical role of data in enabling others to hold those policy makers to account. Um, and that, um, and, and really kind of delighted that that has also um, entered the conversation. So, so thank you for that. Um, let me turn now to, um, to Charles Kimpolo, who has led, um, who has really been been so key across, you know, much of um, much of the region in working with some of the governments that you have seen here and many others in helping to deliver the some of the capacity building that again is a really critical element of data for now as we have discussed with, with partner governments what is needed. We've heard already some of the issues around access to data, around data infrastructure from our colleagues in Senegal and so on, but all of this relies on having people who are able to use the data, to use the infrastructure, to understand the methodologies and apply them in a way that produces reliable information upon which we've just heard both policy making and accountability depend. So Charles, let me just hear from you um, a little bit about you know, your, some of the um, key contributions that, that AIMS has made and really how, what you see as the benefits of being involved for, for AIMS in the, the Data for Now program across the region and, and beyond. Thank you. I thank you very much, uh, Claire. It's great to be part of this conversation. So as you rightly put it, uh, from the inception workshop that happened in Kigali, um, AIMS um, has always been part of the conversation with uh, other partners. And to As to be as inclusive as possible to bring everyone uh, together uh, for us to contribute in achieving uh, 
take initiative because we believe that uh, addressing sustainable development goals should be common purpose. I don't see any in the world that doesn't believe that key to do. So as an academic and researcher institution, um, MS has leveraged both the expertise, the know-how, uh, which is what we but also the resources of having a Pan-African network of center of excellence across uh, Africa. To do a couple of things. Uh, one is what you said, uh, sit on the table, help assess the skills and capacity gaps, especially of government institutions that are involved in the initiative. Cameron made it very clear that it was a principle for government to take the leadership. So for us, it's important to assess the capacity and uh, the skills gap and see what we can do. Once you do that, um, the next things to do is what we are good at, which is developing a new partnership to design, deploy, what I call need driven. This is on the supply side. Eh? So if the need are defined, the priority are defined, how do you supply the skills? How do you develop curriculum and training that respond to that need? For us to develop um, uh, what I call capacity development training as a response for the identify uh, uh, skills gap. And so, yes, there's a couple of examples maybe you wanted me to share, but for me, the partnership that a uh, global partnership for sustainable development data brought forward because the, uh, the role that you are playing to really bring all stakeholders together is quite key um, in a manner of trying to leverage those kind of relationships and do things a little bit differently. And that's like the type of innovation. So I have an example of uh, the data science fellowship program that both GPS, DD, and EMS uh, developed. The objective was for us to really strengthen the skills and capacity of African institutions, uh, data science tools and techniques to enhance data and statistical processes and outcome. So if you have more time, I'm gonna um, maybe share the example of concrete outcome from this kind of partnership where we're working with government institutions in uh, countries to really help them move from priority definition, from need assessment to really work together and uh, deliver concrete project with real uh, output. So for EMS, I think we need to continue doing that, uh, be on the table to, to ensure that government really have the capacity, be it from the skill side or the, the infrastructure that will allow them to take that leadership position as a, uh, Cameroon uh, put it right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. It's been a real pleasure to work with you. And I think as you, um, you know, as you rightly said, one of the hallmarks of data for now is not just innovation in data sources, but also innovation in how we work together. And I think the fellowship is, is a really good example of that. And, you know, very excited that after, as you say, some really successful um, initial um, initial works. We're hoping to be able to scale up the the fellowship program very soon. So watch this space. Um, and you know, I think it's a great example of how we can kind of use data for now really as a learning platform um, and learn together through this this community about how to to improve um, improve our practice. So we've heard a lot. Um, We've heard a lot from, from different speakers about some of the sort of specific country level um, initiatives and some of the great progress that's been going on now. I want to turn now to, um, to Rachel um, in her capacity as the head of statistics at SCAP and just think about the, the regional perspective. You, you know, in different ways have been involved with data for now from the from the very beginning and seen it grow. And I wonder from your, you know, from your now current perspective at SCAP, how you see data for now helping with the kind of regional perspective and helping to build those communities for innovation and for progress at the regional level. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you very much. And as you say, I have been involved right, right from the beginning. Um, yeah, I think that what we have been seen is we've got lots of examples, as we've heard already today, about what's going on at the country level. Um, and we've got lots of examples of kind of in one country where one indicator has been worked on and a whole new kind of partnership has been developed there. But I think that in order for us to really look at the future, we need to look at how we can really build on that and how we can scale that up because we obviously can't kind of devote the resources that have been kind of put into working at one country on one indicator. Um, we need to kind of actually look now, I think, at how we can actually build a bit more to actually build at scale. 
So we need to kind of look at not just what we're doing on one indicator, but how we can kind of develop tools that can then be used, say, on another on another kind of similar indicator or used in a kind of another context and then use those tools, adapt them maybe, but kind of build on what's being done already so that what we're not having to do is to keep kind of rebuilding when we're kind of coming to look at every single separate indicator in, in every country. So I think in terms of the role for ESCAP and other regional organisations, I think there's a real role for us there in terms of how we can help countries with that, really in terms of there's definitely more to be done in the area of training. We know that there's still huge needs around kind of areas like geospatial data, lots of different big data techniques where we actually need to really um, do some very focused training, I would say, on, that, on the things like small area estimation as well. I mean, I think there are other good examples, things like in the ESCAP region we started or my predecessor started two years ago, a series of stats cafes, which we do every week or every couple of weeks, which is just a kind of hour or so virtual kind of uh, workshops and bring people together, but kind of look at one particular topic and countries are really able to actually share what's going on. But it gives them an opportunity to actually do it quite informally and actually talk to each other about different examples. And I think that has really started to kind of spur people on and beginning to actually ask questions from each other about, oh, well, I heard about this, can you tell me a bit more? So we've seen lots of examples there about countries sharing, uh, Indonesia sharing the work they were doing on tourism data, using kind of web scraping there's lots of others um, like that but I think things like those informal fora can, can really help I mean going forward I think we probably uh, need to continue to build the, continue to build the partnerships but also I think look a little bit more carefully at some of the guidance that we've got um, and also work a bit more I think about joining up the country level what's going on there with the kind of global guidance, global uh, training um, and helping countries a bit more so that they can really scale up this work. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And I think that's really helpful to sort of show us all how at every level learning is really sort of fully part of the DNA of this initiative. It runs right through from, from the learning um, that, we're, that you know, is happening within countries, between different stakeholders and so on, right through to our learning about how to run an effective program. And then of course, this learning, as you say, at the regional level and across communities formed around different challenges, different sectors that can really make sure that the innovation that we're generating in, in these countries is being diffused um, right across the network and, and through the programme. So, so thank you, um, thank you so much. Now we are inevitably almost out of time on this panel, but I'm very aware that we absolutely haven't got anywhere close to tapping the, the expertise of all of the panel members. So if I may, I'm going to do that classic, uh, Chair's, um, chair's annoying last question uh, <laughs> tactic and invite you all for a sort of one or two word answer. You know, data for now is all about finding the places where innovation can make the most difference and innovation not for its own sake, but to support systems, to support policy and to really ensure that statistical systems are delivering what their users need. Um, and the users, of course, of politicians, but also the citizens of a country. So I would love to hear from each of you in as few words as possible. Um, what are the specific areas in which you think innovation is most needed? And it could be, we could be thinking about a sector, we could be thinking about a type of data, about a function or area of activity. What's your wish list for where you would most love to be able to drive forward innovation um, in your particular context. So let me go back uh, to the same order in which everybody first spoke. And Virati, I'm afraid it falls to you to, uh, to kick off, uh, to just um, quickly come in with um, your, you know, one or two words on what's your dream for where you most want innovation to happen. Uh, thank you. Uh, from the, the today's presentation, I think we learned it a lot. And uh, from our side, we are really happy uh, to uh, involve in areas like uh, the involvement of geospatial information or merging the geospatial information with the uh, statistical data, and also on. Uh, 
uh, small area estimation since we have a, a problem in these areas uh, to provide data at a disaggregated level. Thank you. Thank you so much, really clear there. And I hope my colleagues from Data for Now are writing all this down because as we need these, we need to understand these priorities to design the next phase of the programme. So thank you. Jana, let me turn to you next. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Yeah, so the first thing that actually comes to my mind then is of course being able to link data, linking administrative data sources, because we see that we need to build registers, if we have all kind of business registers or population registers, being able to data, uh, link all the available data would be really, really useful. And I also want to just mention that I think this initiative <laughs> by, by also engaging the users and the producers, that this is also, maybe it's not innovation, but somehow it's very difficult to do. And I think this is maybe, a tool using this initiative to get people on board so i'll stop there thank you that's a really good point no we have a very broad definition of innovation and i think that that definitely counts so thank you omar yeah thank you very much and i've just posted a link uh, uh in the chat that gave a, a, a example of what we have been able to do publishing uh using uh earth observation and administrative data leveraging this because administrative data is where we can focus to get local level data disaggregated data that feed directly into policies and when we did this for five only five districts uh, in november 2021 now as we speak i'm in the next room training people who are now going to do it for 101 districts out of the 261 district in Ghana. and so this is a, a, a classical example of uh, the demand of, of, of data for now and providing data now to those who need it most to, uh, 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 to solve local problems. And for, for us, this is uh, something that we want to continue to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think a really good reminder that, you know, we have to take this right through to the local level um, if this is really going to have the impact that we want. So, so thank you um, so much to you, Charles. And thank you, uh, Claire. I was just thinking about how can we sustain the positive change that we're talking about? Uh, for me, the human side is very important to change the way we really build capacity and upskills the champion in this institution. I'm looking at change of mindset in the way we build capacity so that we put this champion, this uh, official statistician at the center of sustaining those kind of uh, changes that we're making. So we don't want to send them to the university to do another degree in data science. I think we just need to innovate the way of training them. I think that's key uh, because we need to sustain this kind of change that we're making. So that's, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thanks. And I think that point exactly about champions political leadership. This is not just a technical challenge. This is a political challenge. And many of you on the panel exemplify huge success in really manage, marrying the sort of technical challenges with the political advocacy and leadership that are necessary to actually create that change that we want. So very point, very well taken there. Thank you. And Rachel. Thank you so much. And yeah, the problem with going last is that lots of people have said what I was going to say already. But I think the one thing I would really say is I think we really need an innovation, a change of mindset. I think we need to be much more open and actually just open to new sources, open new tools to new methods. And I think with that spirit of openness, the tools and the methods and the data is there, but actually we just need to change our mindset and be willing to try new things and to do that together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. And I think that's a fantastic place to end this panel with a focus on the human dimensions and to really remember that these the institutions that we are talking about are made up of people and relationships between people um, and the processes that we want to contribute to and that we want to use to affect change likewise are all about people relationships between people um, and the way that they work together thank you so much um, to all of you for the panel discussion which has been fantastic and really stimulating and also just you know, personal thanks to all of you for your huge support for the Data for Now initiative. It's been such a pleasure to, to work with you over the last few years. And I think as we continue to build this community, just really, really excited for what we can, even more excited now after this discussion for what we can do together on the next phase. So um, huge thanks. And let me now um, hand over to my colleague, uh, Vibeka, 
uh, from uh, the UN Statistics Division um, for any final points and the closing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claire. And uh, yeah, it's really exciting to, <clears throat> to hear everything that, that has been said and, and, and all the engagement. I know we are running over time, but there's been so much engagement and conversations in the chat are also from the presentations from the two countries. So I want to very quickly give uh, the two countries a chance to, to come back. Uh, I see that, that Juliet and Vahan have been very active in, in the Q&A responding to questions, but maybe if you very quickly want to summarize uh, some of the, the feedback that you gave. And maybe also, I think that relates to the way forward, what, what you still see as the next, uh, next steps in your work. So Juliet, if you can maybe summarize in a minute or two um, on this, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. We were uh, talking in the chat uh, and trying to answer the questions. There are very specific questions, but in general terms, there are questions regarding the representativeness uh, of, uh, in the use of these uh, new sources. And um, that is, is still a challenge. Uh, we, we, we think that we uh, can overcome that challenge, increasing the size of the samples, uh, continue exploring new models, but also um, it, it's still a challenge and probably the, work to, the working together uh, could be uh, very productive to overcome this challenge. Uh, uh, other questions are related with the work with other actors at the national statistical system and how to ensure that the production of statistical information based on these new sources uh, is used and is considered like a rigorous and, and, and supports the decision making. This is a still a process under construction. We, uh, in the case of the discrimination project, we work together with the presidency and, and, and that collaboration allow us to establish a, like a categories to a, make the classification of the comments of Facebook a, respecting like a, the conceptual framework of discrimination. So I think a, this is a, a process that is continuous and we need to uh, continue uh, uh, get involved with new actors and try to understand with those perspectives the, the problems we want to solve with these new sources. Uh, I, I hope we can like, continue chatting and answer the questions and working together uh, related, in relation with these topics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juliet. And I think also uh, for everyone who has input or ideas, uh, don't hesitate to reach out either to us or to Colombia on this. I think it's it's we're really happy to to engage with partners and, and and see how it can be further improved. There's also one question that I'd like to ask quickly to to uh, colleagues in Senegal, and that is whether Senegal has a data protection legislation uh, that had to be considered when integrating the varied various COVID nineteen data bases and how that impacted the ownership of the data. So if you uh, um, Madon could quickly respond to that uh, kind of how that works in, in uh, Senegal, that would be great. Yeah, really quickly, I can say that uh, Senegal have a data protection legislation, uh, but for the data COVID, the hub for the data COVID-19, uh, we don't use the micro data, we use the, the aggregated data for, for um, because of this legislation, we cannot use um, uh, micro data, uh, uh, especially uh, because these data are not produced by NSD, but are produced by the stakeholder of the S uh, NSS, and they, uh, it is really um, sensitive uh, data. So uh, we ask them to to work with aggregated data. So I think this is the my answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madan, and then we also look forward to the continued work uh, in Senegal. So I will then move on to, to the closing. Uh, I think so much had been, has been said that, that I don't need to say too much. Just re-emphasizing some of the things that we have heard um, that has come up in, in these discussions and in the presentations. The Data for Now initiative is country-led. Uh, you see that on how the countries have taken very different approaches. Um, the ones that we are already working with. Uh, it is policy and user need oriented. 
uh, we heard how the different countries are engaging with policymakers and, and really get responses to that. And that's something we really want to continue highlighting and, and working on. It focuses a lot on innovation, but at the same time, as was said, um, it's with uh, statistical offices at the lead and we need to follow the UN principles of official statistics, follow, follow data quality standards and so on. So, so we need to balance that. Partnerships, I think, has been showcased throughout the session today, and, and we are happy to bring more partners on board, engage as widely as possible um, under this initiative. Two things that um, have been mentioned also, I mean, I think particularly by Rachel, is on the kind of how do we scale up. Um, Currently, we have been, as, as core partners, we've been able to secure more funding, so we will now be, be able to work with more countries. We also have partners that can work with, with uh, countries under this initiative, but we will continue to secure more funds um, and partnerships so that we can widen the engagement uh, under the initiative. The other thing is also that we are starting to share solutions. Um, uh, we will be sharing training materials from the work in the countries. UNSD currently has published uh, trainings from, from uh, Senegal and Colombia. I'll put that in the chat in a second. Um, the goal is really for as many as possible to benefit from this so that it's possible to, to engage and, and, and use materials even, even if it's not necessarily um, a, a direct training that can be received. So we will do what we can to, to kind of make this a solution that is helpful to as many as possible. And, and we're looking forward to all of your engagement uh, on this. And the only thing I, I would like to end with now is to thank everyone that was engaged, um, uh, all participants, all uh, speakers, moderators. It's been a really great event and, and thank you so much and, and looking forward to the continuation. Bye-bye, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for all of your work. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you.